So with our first, uh, with our first speaker in our panel this morning, it's uh, Jim Peterson. And Jim is the founder of the nonprofit Evergreen Foundation, publisher of Evergreen Magazine. And Evergreen has produced special IFMAT uh, 1998, uh, 2005, and 2013, as Jim has worked with the Intertribal Timber Council and many of the tribes out here in producing a magazine to tell the country about the Indian Forest uh, story. So would you please join me in welcoming Jim Peterson. Good morning. The power goes off again. I'm in big trouble. Um, I have the pleasure of teeing up some very informative presentations that have been assembled by some really smart people. You are to be forgiven for wondering why I'm standing here again for the fourth time in recent years. And the answer to the question, why am I here, lies in a really strange telephone call that I got last January from Steve Andringa. Strange because if you know Steve, as I do, you know that he isn't much for small talk. But here he was chatting me up and wondering how I was doing and <laughs> telling me that, gee whiz, now that you're a member of the ITC family, might you be interested in speaking this morning? Well, given my immense dedication to the fact that I've made a lot of friends in this organization, I wanted to say right off that I'd be thrilled to come and visit with you but I sensed that Steve was getting ready to really grease the skids. So I casually asked him if it was his idea that I come and speak with you or if it was Gary Morishima's idea. <laughs> well, he said in his most official voice, the idea was actually Gary's. But wait for it now, wait for it. But when you hit the ball out of the park, I'm going to take credit for it. <laughs> so. Here's hoping that I hit the ball out of the park, because if I don't, it's Steve's fault. Since not all of you know me as well as Steve or Gary, I uh, know that I really cherish my relationship with ITC and its membership, and I'm really humbled to be here again and grateful that you've allowed me to be one of your most outspoken advocates for the last 17 years. The Evergreen Foundation, which I started 30 years ago this spring, has acted as publisher of the plain English versions of your last three IFMAT reports, 1998, 2006, and 2013. We were also heavily involved in your 2010 branding and marketing study, and we're currently under contract to develop a communications plan for your anchor forestry initiative. My title this morning is Your Story is Your Brand, Part 3, Why Indian Forestry is the Cure for What Ails Our National Forests. I covered Part 2 in Seattle in 2011 and Part 1 in my keynote address at your 33rd Annual Timber Symposium in Lewis and Idaho in 2009. Some of you will recall that I also keynoted your 31st Timber Symposium at Quatucknock on Flathead Lake in Polson, Montana in 2007. That was the year that I asked aloud if it was time for the nation to consider giving all of the federal lands that it had stolen from Indians back to those Indians. The answer now is then is a resounding yes. It is time for the federal government to return the lands that it willfully took during its era of manifest destiny. And in a strange and unexpected way, this is beginning to happen. Which brings me to this whole business of why I here for what ails our national forests. Your presenters today will string together four main threads in this epic moment in our nation's long forest history. These threads are as follows. The National Indian Forest Management Assessment Act, the National Indian 
Forest Management Resources Act, the 2004 Tribal Forest Protection Act, and finally, ITC's Anchor Forestry Initiative and its associated communications plan. In his keynote address last hour, IFMAT co-chair John Gordon made delightful use of Lewis Carroll's metaphorical looking glass to explain how tribes grafted, I think that's a wonderful word here, grafted science and technology onto their own tree of knowledge to create what we call Indian forestry. We have held the marvelous fruits of this tree up for public inspection in the clear light of truth in all three of our Evergreen IFMAT reports. Forestry in Indian Country, Progress and Promise, published in June of 1998. Forestry in Indian Country, Models of Sustainability for Our Nation's Forests, published in November of 2006. Solving Forestry, Federal Forestry's Rubik's Cube, published in May of 2014. You get the idea. Now, borrowing from John Gordon's nod to Lewis Carroll, I think it is time for our nation to step through the looking glass and explore the fantastical world, another great word from Lewis Carroll, the fantastical world that is Indian forestry. Initially, it will look like Jabberwocky, that being another wonderful Lewis Carroll word. Jabberwocky. That's how it looked to Alice when she stepped through the looking glass out of her snowy winter night and into the sunny spring garden, Alice's wonderland, where flowers were given the power of human speech. To gain a glimpse into the world that stretches beyond the looking glass, listen to these words from Earth's Gifts, a short piece that Gary Morishima, Don Motanic, and I penned together a few years back when we were looking for a way to describe the Indian connection to land and, and place. Here's what we wrote. We are Indian people. As the first stewards, we have cared for the land since before time began. Our natural resource management practices are rooted in traditions, knowledge, and wisdom handed down to us by our ancestors over countless generations. Our creator has entrusted us with the care of our land and its resources. In exchange, he has blessed us with precious gifts of life, foods, clothing, medicine, fuel, shelter, and goods for trade and commerce, the means for nurturing our bodies, minds, and spirits. We share a deeply felt responsibility to protect the land for those who will follow in our footsteps. The future of our peoples depends on stewardship of natural resources that are both our heritage and legacy. We care for Earth, so she will care for us. We are part of the land, and the land is part of us. It is the Indian way. Now, <clears throat> compare this soul-filled tapestry, these beautiful words, with the U.S. Forest Service's passionless and indifferent motto, caring for the land and serving the people. Let me repeat that just in case I missed some secret meaning here. Caring for the land and serving the people. Now ask yourself, who would you want to hire to care for your forest? Who would you hire after you learned that more than 140,000 square miles of forest land in Forest Service care are in what fire ecologists call condition class two or condition class three. Class three lands are ready to burn and class two lands soon will be. So who would you hire? Is there even a question here? John Gordon and John Sessions, if Matt co-chairs from day one, have done an exquisite job of laying out Indian forestry's assets and liabilities. The assets yours and the liabilities all attributable to the fact that the federal government is failing to fully fund its long-held treaty obligations. But we're making progress. Witness the Tribal Forest Protection Act and the National Indian Forest Management Resources Act, the former a congressional admission that federal forests are in such terrible shape that they pose a serious economic, environmental, and cultural risk 
to tribes that own and manage their own timber land, and the latter a model for moving away from sterile, prescriptive forest management toward a more holistic approach like what tribes have been doing on their lands for eons. In their presentations today, Gary Morishima and Vinnie Caro explain how ITC's Anchor Forestry Initiative reconciles a host of economic, environmental, and cultural challenges facing not only Indian tribes that own forest land adjacent to federal lands, but also non-tribal Indian, non-tribal communities in nearby rural areas, and not only tribal forest land that it lies adjacent to federal land, but also other public and private ownerships that lie adjacent to federal forests that are falling apart. If Anchor Forestry has an author, and I think it does, it's Gary. And if it has a builder, and again, I think it does, it's Vinny. And if there are visionaries here who want to breathe life into the architect's plan, it is the Yakima and Colville tribes. For they are the ones who are holding up their forests to neighboring landowners and saying, here we are. Come join us in a great collaboration that will yield dazzling benefits for all of us. Come, let us step through the looking class together. A waitress in Colville, Washington recently asked me what Indian forestry looked like. In reply, I asked her if she'd ever driven Highway 17 south from Omac. Oh dear. <laughs> Yikes. South from Omac to Cooley City, Washington. Yes, she said, I have. I said, all those beautifully thin forests on both sides of the highway belong to the Colville tribe. And all of those overgrown thickets that block your view from here to Cooley City belong to you. Me, she said. How can that possibly be? I said, because you are a member of the public that the Forest Service serves. So again, who do you want to manage your forest? Probably not the same people who in 1988 left about 200 million board feet of fire-killed timber standing alongside Highway 20 on Sherman Pass between Omac and Kettle Falls, Washington. Jim Erickson will be our last presenter this morning. If the Tribal Forest Protection Act has a Pied Piper, he is it. My wife Julia and I attended two of Jim's TFPA seminars this spring. Listening to Jim talk about his passion for tribal forestry is like drinking from a fully charged fire hose. You best bring dry clothes. <laughs> At Jim's Spokane seminar, we learned that only a few people in the Forest Service seem to understand that the Tribal Forest Protection Act grants tribes the authority to enter into agreements with the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management to do restoration work on federal forest and rangeland that pose and it, that pose a risk to adjacent tribal lands. My gut tells me that many Forest Service folks consider this intrusion to be an, a, personal, a personal affront, but it isn't meant to be. But the misplaced perception here, I think, underscores the fact that tribal forestry makes some federal folks pretty nervous. I think I'd be nervous too if 90 million acres of land in my care was in condition class two or condition class three. Jim's OMAX seminar was a different story. We sat in a circle in the middle of a gymnasium and talked for six hours about the Tribal Forest Protection Act and all of the, rec the restoration work that needed to be done on how on earth were we going to get it done. The mere fact that we could talk for six hours about a piece of legislation that is only three pages long, I think attests to how much work needs to be done and what opportunities there are for tribes to get this work done. First up this morning is an old friend, Butch Blazer, the Forest Service's Deputy Undersecretary for Natural Resources and Environment. Butch and I met in the spring of, of 2004, about a year after Congress passed the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. He was New Mexico State Forester then, and I think he probably knew a little bit about me from HFRA and certainly from our previous efforts on behalf of IFMAT. Anyway, he called me one day out of the blue and he said, in typical Bush fashion, he said, listen, he said, uh, I need your help. How soon can you get down here? I flew from Montana to Albuquerque the next week and we met in Rio Doso. 
and I was to learn that no community in the United States faced a greater risk from wildfire than that community, which interestingly is very popular with the motor coach set from Texas, water recreation. There were trees everywhere, and the great, a great many of them were dying of stresses brought on by drought and stand density, a stand density problem unlike any that, frankly, I'd ever seen. The underlying problem in New, in New Mexico was and is, as it is much across much of the interior west, the fact that there is too little wood processing infrastructure to handle the enormous amount of wood fiber that forest restoration will generate if it's done right and done on a large scale. New Mexico lost its last big sawmill in 2003. Neighboring Arizona has but one major mill left, and that's the one that's run by the White Mountain Apache tribe at White River. New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, governor at the time, hired Butch and told him he wanted the state's 835,000 acres of forest land to look like the Mescalero tribe's forest which is a beautiful example of what you can do when you put your mind to it. Butch is with us this morning to offer his insights into the ever-changing political climate in Washington, D.C. I recently asked a friend if he, might, if he thought Butch might be interested in being the next chief of the Forest Service. It's not too soon to think about who the next chief of the Forest Service ought to be. Anyway, Butch sent word that he wasn't interested in the job. He's tired wants to go home to New Mexico and be with his family. That's his gain and our loss. After lunch, we'll hear from Larry Mason and Russ Vaughan first. Larry and I have been friends for more than 25 years. We met at a big 4th of July salmon bake in Forks, Washington. I liked him instantly and miraculously, I still do. Uh, after the spotted owl ran Larry out of the sawmill game, he enrolled in the University of Washington and earned a couple of degrees and quickly became a thorn, a thorn in the side of a few academics who don't really seem to understand that forests left to nature's vagaries don't do very well and certainly don't meet society's myriad forest needs. Larry's great strength, I think, lies in the fact that he's a born skeptic and he has a well-honed talent for confronting dreamers, that would be me too, um, with facts, nasty little facts. If you want that dream to come true, you better pay attention to this, because if you don't, your dream is going to remain just that, a dream. Russ Vaughan will follow Larry, and will share some of his perspectives on forest collaboration and an interesting project called A to Z. Uh, you're going to be pretty amazed, I think, but what, what Russ has to say about the A to Z project, and I don't want to steal his thunder, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, an acquaintance recently asked me if I could describe Russ. I don't know why he asked the question. I don't know what he'd heard about Russ, but he said to me, what can you tell me about him? What's he like? And I, without giving it a moment's thought, I just said, sure. I said, uh, He's the environmental whisperer. This so other guy said to me, he said, what the hell does that mean? I said, well, you know, like the horse whisperer. He's just the environmental whisperer. <laughs> um, like his father, Dwayne, who I've known for some 20 years, Russ has invested an enormous amount of his time and energy in developing collaborative approaches to solving some of the most difficult and contentious problems facing uh, decision makers, if you will, on the Colville National Forest. The dialogue that he started with, he and his father started with environmentalists in northeast Washington has yielded some, in my mind, some huge benefits. I don't know of a forest collaborative that has lasted longer or been more successful or frankly one that can be majored in millions of board feet delivered to the mill. It's very impressive. Um, and I think it's a welcome sea change that comes along at a time when a lot of people have grown increasingly tired, if you will, of the big fist fight between environmentalists and lumbermen that actually began in the early 70s. 
We're telling the marvelous story of Flora's collaboration on our Evergreen website in a series of question and answer interviews, and we put up one a week. Soon we're going to start putting up two a week. If you're not following these series, I want to suggest that you do, and the reason that I want to suggest that you do is that I firmly believe that collaboration can do a great deal to help advance not only tribal forestry, but um, the anchor forestry story. As part of this interview series, we're going to be visiting with tribal members from both the Colville and Yakima tribes because we think what they're doing to try to advance anchor forestry on the ground is really important. Our last panel today convenes at 3 o'clock. Um, Phil Rigdon, who is your president and deputy director of the Yakima Nation's Department of Natural Resources, will offer a tribal perspective on all things political, economic, and environmental. I always enjoy listening to Phil because I never know what he's going to say next. I, I, I recently in confidence said to a mutual friend, I said, you know, I never know. And he said, not to worry, Phil doesn't know either. <laughs> well, I thought, that's kind of cheesy, you know, but th this morning I sat down beside Phil at breakfast and I said, so, what are you going to talk about this afternoon? He said, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, I guess Phelan Haven is not here today, but uh, Dave Koch is. Uh, I don't know him well enough to make jokes about him, or really, <laughs> or you know, so I, he's. I guess he's you're the acting chief for. Is that what he is, the acting chief? Butch, help me out here. Is he acting chief? Okay, Erickson's, you know, bobbing up and down again. Um, anyway, he's going to be here. Uh, Cody Disotel is with us too. Um, I'm sure you all know him um, from the Colville tribe. Um, he's their land management and property director. Um, I consider him to be one of the real rising stars in Indian forestry and anchor forestry. I've been around long enough to be able to say that, and he really is. This young man just impresses the daylights out of me. So I'll be real interested in what he has to say. Um, we're going to make pretty good use of Cody in a video that we're producing this summer as part of our contract to, to, to uh, deliver a communications program for the Anchor Forestry Project. Um, <coughs> I'd like to close out with a brief explanation of what this program is really all about, because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we finally explain to a nation that doesn't know hardly anything about forestry. This is where we explain to them what tribal forestry and what anchor forestry are all about and what it will look like on the ground. Um, those of you who've known me for a while know I can get pretty worked up about this stuff. I don't know if I'm as bad as Jim Erickson yet, but I'm getting close. Um, the bottom line here is that the beauty and the symmetry of the story of Indian forestry, forestry in Indian country, if you will, is unequaled in the entire world of forestry. And I've been at this a real long time, and I'm telling you, it's true. There is no other story that is as powerful visually or in words than the story that you can tell about yourselves. Because no one else can say the things that you can say and say them honestly about the connection, your connection to land and place, and no one else can talk the way you can about the economic, environmental, and cultural importance of nurturing Earth's gifts, what Gary has called the triple bottom line. Treaty law, IFMAP, the Tribal Forest Protection Act, and the National Indian Forest Resources Management Act provide the tools that you need to move forward. Anchor forestry, I think, lights the way. Our job, yours and ours, our collective obligation is to lead the nation through the looking glass and out into the sunny spring garden that is forestry in Indian country. Thanks for the invitation.